Moving on, in this video I'm going to start with numerical methods or numerical analysis. These aren't the exact same but are close and I will use them interchangeably. But numerical methods are basically a way to approximate solutions to a mathematical problem and this is done often when you can't solve something analytically, but let me explain what that is. In calculus, for example, you learn how to find the area under a curve. Like I showed in part 1, if you have, let's say, x squared and want to find that entire area from, let's say, x equals 0 to 2, to find it exactly, you have to integrate x squared from x equals 0 to 2. So then you add 1 to the exponent, divide by that same number, and you plug in 2, then you also plug in 0, then subtract the 2, and you get your answer, and this is the exact area under the curve. If you haven't taken calculus yet, then don't even worry about this part. But this is the analytical approach to this problem because it's an exact solution we found. Pretty much everything you've done in math has probably been analytical. But sometimes this integral here is impossible to evaluate, as in there's no way you can solve for the antiderivative which you need to plug in the numbers. So if we have an integral of some function, whatever it may be, and there's no way to solve it, which definitely does happen, what can we do? Well, one way is we can approximate the area using rectangles. You'd have some width of each rectangle, and they would also all have some height that usually matches a point on the graph. As you can see, the left points of all these rectangles meet at the graph. Then you just add all those areas up, and you get an approximate area under the curve. And this right here is the numerical method. It gives us an approximation to the right answer. This is especially needed when an exact answer is not possible. But what if we want a really accurate solution? Because as you can see, there will be error. Those rectangles don't match the curve very well. So what we can do is just put more rectangles. However, you probably don't want to calculate these all yourself, because it would take a while, and that's where computers come in. Computers are great for solving problems numerically. In fact, whether you are using a graphing calculator to solve a complex problem, or solving for the force in a complex system using finite element analysis, the computers are using numerical methods, and someone or multiple someones had to program that in. That's one reason this class is extremely crucial. But these rectangle approximations are just one numerical method. Given that computers can only run so fast and we want very accurate solutions, would using rectangles be the best method? Well, you could also use trapezoids. As you can see, this is more accurate for the same quantity of trapezoids as rectangles. Then there's also a method that uses quadratic polynomials to approximate the function, which is known as Simpson's rule, which you may have learned. Okay, so you've learned this in calculus most likely, very possibly in high school. So what more is there to learn? Well, numerical methods can be used to solve many things. There are numerical methods to solve differential equations or partial differential equations, which is likely what you will spend a large amount of time on in a class like this. You will learn methods to solve these analytically, but in your numerical methods class, you'll learn ways to approximate problems because sometimes they are difficult or impossible to do analytically. So like here, the red line is the analytical solution, and the others are from two different numerical methods. So as you can see, they approximate the solution pretty well. In fact, if you go to the Wikipedia page for partial differential equations, they have a section titled Analytical Solutions, and this would be a lot of what you cover in a partial differential equations class that I discussed in the last video. Then there's a section titled Numerical Solutions, and one of those numerical solutions is the finite element method, otherwise known as finite element analysis. This breaks the system down into small parts called finite elements and approximates the solution with high accuracy. Then even some majors like aerospace, mechanical, or civil engineering can take a class called finite element analysis and apply this in your respective field. But in the real world, whether you are using software to find the forces on some random object like you see here, or calculate complicated fluid flow, or for calculating the trajectories of spacecrafts, these all typically require numerical methods, especially when done on the computer. And if you are someone who makes these programs, it would obviously involve a lot of intensive math, but you are going to just learn the basics in your first class in college. To end this part on numerical methods, I'll show another basic example to give you more of an idea of just how to think about numerical methods. If I asked you to write a program that could solve this, well, for one, you could use the quadratic formula. Program that in and it will spit out the right answer. But the quadratic formula itself is an analytical solution because it gives an exact answer. But what if you were asked to solve this? There is no quote quadratic formula for a problem like this. So how would you solve it? Or more importantly, how would you have a computer solve it? 
because when you punch this in on your graphing calculator, it will give you the right answer. But how does it do this? What's running in the background if there is no formula? Well, it's some numerical method. So one way I'll show it is not a great method, but to show it, first I'll put an x and y axis. Then if we plug in x equals zero, you get a y coordinate of negative three. And then at x equals one, y would also equal one. So since this is continuous, you know that somewhere in between those two points must be one of the zeros. It's got to go through the x-axis. Maybe more than once, but it's got to go through at least once. So then you could average those x points and plug in x equals one half, which would yield a y value of around negative 2.4. So since that's still below the x-axis, it means there's some zero between one half and one. So as you can see, we narrowed it down, and by doing this over and over, you can keep narrowing it down until you get a pretty exact solution. This is not a perfect method, of course, but it maybe gives you an idea for how numerical methods work. But there is another method that's better, where you'd be given the curve, and you would take a point, basically a guess of where you think the zero is, and you would not need to see the graph, so you wouldn't know exactly where it is. Then at that point, you would draw a tangent line which again, you can all solve on paper. You don't need a graph to do this. Then you look at where it intersects the x-axis. That intersection is sort of close to the zero that we're trying to solve for, but not a great approximation. So what you do is go to that y-coordinate on the graph from that x, and then make another tangent line. And every time you repeat this, the x-intercept of that tangent line should get closer to our real zero, which you can see here. If you did this like four or five times, you would land very close to your real zero. This is called Newton's method or the newton rapson method. And you can also see an animation here. You may need to watch it a few times, but you will see what's going on. Don't even worry about why it works or anything like that. And also know it's not a perfect solution, but it is one method or a root finding algorithm you could learn about. So whether it's partial or ordinary differential equations, roots of polynomials, evaluating integrals, and so on, you can see why numerical methods are so crucial. Now majors like aerospace engineering and mechanical engineering often will take a class dedicated to numerical analysis or numerical methods and learning all these. Electrical engineers may or may not take an entire class on it, it just depends on your school, but they will learn some of these methods within their major classes for sure. Then other majors like physics or even civil engineering likely will have to learn some of these concepts, but it may or may not be in an actual numerical methods class, it might just be in their major classes. Like some civil engineers might learn numerical methods for hydraulic engineering problems within one of their civil engineering courses, rather than its own numerical methods course. But overall, numerical methods is very important for learning the limitations of these approximations, because you might need to know why some approximation doesn't actually work, and it's also needed to develop faster ways to calculate solutions to complicated problems. Now moving on, the next class is statistics, and actually most engineering disciplines will take a class on statistics. In the class, you'd probably start with probability and determining odds of like rolling certain numbers with dice, or picking some certain cards from a deck. You'd get into standard deviation, normal distributions, and so on, which is basically a review of what you did in high school, but you will likely go a little more in depth on these topics. But then you will move on from what you learned in high school. And I won't cover everything, but one example is continuous probability distributions, where outcomes can happen on any range of numbers. So if you have some computer part, and you want to know the probability of when a part will fail, it could happen after one year, two years, 2.5743 years, and anything in between. It's a continuous range rather than a deck of cards that can only have certain outcomes. So what are the odds that it fails at exactly five years? Well, it's 0%, because there's pretty much no chance it will fail at exactly 5.0000 and so on years, and not a nanosecond off. That's just too exact. So we look at ranges instead, like what's the chance it fails between 5 and 6 years. To solve this, they would give you something known as a probability density function, and for this example, it would just involve finding the area under the curve between 5 and 6. This would yield a decimal answer less than 1, and we turn that into a percent to give us our answer. Or they could flip this and ask how many years until there's a 50% chance the part will fail. But probability and statistics does come up in engineering. Electrical engineers will see it in some of their communications classes. Like digital signals are either high or low voltages or a 1 or 0, which ideally would look like this. But in the real world there will be some noise or interference which adds some chaos to the function. 
If that noise makes the voltage dip too low, then that part might be interpreted as a zero when it should be a one, or vice versa if the signal goes too high during a zero. It would be fine here, but some signals get very noisy. So in a class you might have to determine something called the bit error rate, and what percentage of bits may yield an error due to interference. You know of AM and FM waves, but in digital communications there's plenty you haven't heard of like FSK, ASK, QAM, and more. These will all yield different errors based on how the digital signal is altered. Statistics is used in manufacturing because you will never have 100% success and all parts will work, so you need statistics to model what kind of error you can expect. Or there's statistics involved when people determine the probability that a nuclear plant will melt down. Or determining the probability that a certain drug will work based on patients who were tested and what the results were. Even computer scientists will learn probability, but they will learn more about discrete probability to go along with their discrete math. In cryptography and protecting our nation's sensitive information, statistics is also involved. In fact, when bad guys try to crack a cryptographic system, they are using probabilistic algorithms. But overall, aerospace engineers, electrical engineers, civil engineers, materials engineers, industrial engineers, computer engineers, and so on, will have to take at least one probability course. It's not the most important thing in terms of all these math classes you could see, and it won't come up in like every class, but it is there. And also one of the majors that uses it the most is actually industrial engineering, because they work a lot with processes such as in manufacturing. Then last is discrete math. This is a class taken mainly by computer scientists, computer engineers, and software engineers, but is most crucial for computer scientists, as this is the foundation for learning about algorithms and other topics within computer science. But I'm not going to go into this really because my computer science part 1 video is pretty much only on discrete math. So if you want to learn some example problems you'll do, or some applications, then go check that out and I'll leave a link below for that. And even after all of this, there's still math topics you will see depending on your major. For example, computer and electrical engineers as well as computer scientists will learn about Boolean algebra, which is where variables can only assume two values, a 1 or a 0, aka a true or false value, which is important in digital design and electronics. Instead of things like addition or subtraction, you use things like ands, ors, and nots. And just like you had to learn basic rules of algebra, you have to learn basic rules for this as well. Then electrical engineers also learn about discrete time signals, where instead of a continuous signal, the function is sampled in time. But all these are not their own math courses, you will learn these kinds of things within your engineering courses, unlike Calculus 1 or something where there is a separate math class for it. And lastly, I want to include one thing for people considering physics. In physics for undergrad, you will be required to take most of the things I've talked about in these three videos. Then possibly in undergrad, but definitely if you go on to grad school, especially in a theoretical physics field, there is much more math to come. Math such as topology and dealing with knot theory and really abstract shapes like in higher dimensions, or abstract algebra, which are very high level math concepts that engineers don't take. And of course there's more. So be ready for even more math than you've seen in these three videos. And if you do plan to go into theoretical physics, you should consider taking as many of these upper division math courses as you can that apply to your field, even if they're not required in undergrad, because it will give you a solid foundation. But that's it for the math courses that you'll encounter. If you like this video, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe, and I'll see you all next time.